We are live now. <laughs> well, hello to all of the beautiful beings who are joining us now or in the future. Whatever now moments you're choosing, I am excited to be here with my dear sister, Emily, sharing a topic that is a passion of both of us and excited to just dive into it. And so we can just let people join in, trickle in as they feel called and guided and bless all of those who are watching it later. So this is the second episode of a new little interview series called Thea Sophia Thursdays, which is just like a little passion of mine to share the people that I'm inspired by. So Emily, why don't you introduce yourself and share whatever you want to share about who you are. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, my name as it stands at the moment is Emily Jean Benson. Uh, I am, I am embodied consciousness. That's, Every time I try to say I am something, it just comes down to I am embodied consciousness. I'm the founder of Breathe Beloved. Yeah. Yeah. That feels good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And if you're scrolling this, you know who I am already. And if you don't, I'm Jessica Jones. <laughs> and that's all that really matters. So today we're going to be talking about science and spirituality <laughs> and uh for those of you who join it's kind of like being here with us as though we were in our living room and having a conversation between two friends and just kind of seeing like there's no format there is no questions it's just allowing spirit to move through us and connect on something that we both are passionate about and just see where that kind of rolls so Emily, I'm gonna let you start it off because you inspired this today's topic of what's coming through and wants to be shared first and explored as far as science and spirituality are concerned. Hmm. Well, first, what comes up to share in in the essence of this is just our living room and we're just having a conversation is how personal this topic is to me uh, in that it is something that I have been passionate about. The marriage of science and spirituality has been something which I've been passionate about since, since I knew what those things were and before, <laughs> since I came into this life and before. <laughs> long before. Uh, and for most of this life, I've felt like no one wanted to hear about those two topics, separate or combined. So, so finally coming into this space in recent years where I feel comfortable to speak the truth that have been forcing through this sacred heart since time began <laughs> is a really... <laughs> is a really nourishing and exciting and powerful space to be in. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you to Jessica, because number one, you rock. And number one, yeah. you are and all that you do is awesome and epic. And, and thank mm. you for the space for, for the deepest passions of this soul and this heart to come out into this space. Yay. And really I'm sorry if I go ahead. The the essence of of my being passionate in this time in this place to marry and create a harmonious synergy between science and spirit comes from not the, not the reality that they are separate concepts. Mm -hmm. Rather, it comes from the reality that they are one and they have been perceived as separate for far too long in this particular timeline. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And just like diving into some of the deeper truths of why they were separated to begin with, you know, like I remember reading about when the, the, the Catholic church really paid for that separation to happen so that yeah. there wouldn't be a continual growth of science investing into technologies and experiments that would prove everything that pretty much the church was trying to keep secret from people so that people wouldn't uh, believe in, in those types of truths. So there was kind of this, this, this secret ploy that was designed to keep that two separate because they knew that the moment they merged, people would be, be like, well, F those guys, like, here's the truth. <laughs> because like that's the thing about about the human mind is that we tend to believe more readily something that's logical and tangible and that science or math has proven over something that's spiritual because there there can't be that like linear grasp on it or that tangible grasp to it. That said, the moment science says, "Hey, we have evidence," the mind is like, "Okay, I believe it now." <laughs> true. True. So there was well, this, this whole design. Go ahead. <laughs> we've been in the Kali Yuga now, and the Kali Yuga is the age of materialism, the age of if you cannot measure it and, and define it in rational terms, then it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I so now that shift. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that you hearken back to to the original source of that separation of science and spirituality. I've been diving very deeply into the Dead Sea Scrolls recently and the lost books of the Bible. And they weren't lost. It was actually the Emperor <laughs> Constantine who, I took a little note here, uh, 43, 43 of the original books of the Bible were either entirely erased or rewritten uh, in the time of the Emperor Constantine, specifically to take out the, the scientific and factual empowerment of the individual to find spiritual practices and to connect with spirit in their own way. So it was essentially a way to take the power out of the hands of the people and put it in the hands of the priests. Some of these old books or what were you able to find <laughs> uh so so you can find a lot on on the internet uh a lot of them have been read through at this point and a lot of them have been researched uh initially when they found the dead sea scrolls it was a total happenstantial event a, a goat herd boy was throwing rocks into a cave and he heard a sound and it sounded like something breaking and he dove in and found the first of, of several caves that were just filled with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scrolls, papyrus, vellum, copper. And initially when they found these scrolls, it was put into the hands of four scholars. Only four mm -hmm. scholars were allowed to see those scrolls. And that was for the first 30 years or so after their discovery. Now there are actually texts online. If you look up Dead Sea Scrolls, or if you look up, uh, specifically I've been looking into the Isaiah scroll, which is one of my personal favorites that was found in the very first cave that that goat herd boy found. Yeah. And uh, that one you can find texts of. The, the issue comes in in terms of translating them because they were all in, they were in Hebrew, they were in Aramaic, and they were in, they were in a couple other languages that are not coming into this mind at this moment. That said, mm -hmm. they're, they're fairly common knowledge at this point it's just a matter of seeking out the knowledge. Right, and that's another huge, like that hits the nail on the head right there is that so much of everything that we're talking about now and even outside of this is common knowledge now. It's, it's, it's not necessarily displayed on the, the mainstream media that said everything that was once considered to be conspiracy or spiritual or outside of the mainstream thought is now common knowledge if you just look for it. The internet is 
so amazing <laughs> that it's bringing all of this information and, and making it available for people. It's just, are you willing to, to go into Google uh, or what I like to call God and just like ask? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You are, are you willing to ask? It comes up in this moment that that old, it was it was a poor translation and it was a purposefully poor translation. Ask and ye shall receive. And mm -hmm. uh, seek and ye shall find is another poor translation. Uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, which was which was erased from the Bible and found again in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, they came upon a an ancient Hebrew, an ancient biblical Hebrew original text of that that first seek and ye shall find, uh, ask and ye shall receive. And here I have it written down. It is the closest translation that we can get now of the ancient Hebrew is ask without hidden motive and be surrounded by your answer. Be enveloped by what you desire that your gladness be full. And to me, <laughs> asking you shall receive does not at all carry the same connotation as be enveloped by what you desire. Essentially, that is that is a it is an instruction manual for what we in the neo spiritual community call manifestation. Yeah, the embodiments. Like you have to feel it. Like you can't just recite it over and over again and ask for it and pray for it. You have to literally feel it as though it's happening right now. And that's like the being enveloped by it, like fully embody it. Like you are it already and let it envelop you. Exactly. I love that. <laughs> exactly. How, how beautiful and poignant that when this was all written, and a lot of other traditions did this too, you know, like the Egyptians freaking carved it into the wall. They were like, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be reincarnating. We're going to need this information <laughs> that they had, had a suspicion that, hey, this, this, these gospels, this information is, is so important. And it's, a, there's a very high chance that, that someone along the, along the lines is going to want to use this for power and transform it. So let's, let's, keep them preserved in the Dead Sea and <laughs> allow them to be able to be surfaced so that the truth can be revealed. Exactly. And all of the Dead Sea Scrolls are dated to a couple hundred years before the time of Christ. So we know mm -hmm. that these are teachings that were passed down likely from, from the Egyptians, likely from before the Egyptians. And there have been many, many ways of people who are preserving this knowledge, either by verbal tradition or by stashing scrolls in pots and covering them with sand or carving them in walls or, or encoding them into the sacred geometry of megalithic structures. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, humanity is so beautiful. <laughs> right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> we have so much I'm so optimistic about this time that we're in right now. You know, there's, there's so much unfolding. Something that I continuously come back to in all, of my, in all of my writings and something that is just echoing in my head every single day and surging through my heart is this is the great remembering. We all, we all forgot and that was part of the fun because now we all get to remember. <laughs> And I love, and that's. Go ahead. Finish your thought. I love, love, love the reality that we are now coming into a scientific understanding of how it is that if one member of the human collective understands an idea or embodies a practice, the entire collective is shifted from that. Not just the collective. We can, we can get into it if you like. <laughs> the, the, the entire cosmos is shifted. When one individual learns to re-embody and remember these ancient truths. 
we're all coming back at the same time, whether we're coming back through science or whether we're coming back through spirit or whether we're coming back in the middle of the night when we're, when our conscious mind is not super awake and our subconscious mind is in the forefront and we're like, wait. <laughs> so I would love to ask you, because I know that we all have, you know, we're all unique expressions. And so we all have something that we're really fascinated by. And I know that what fascinates me the most in this like science and spirit, like weaving world is really the work of Bruce Lipton and stem cells in that you're, we are the ones that are responsible for our genetic makeup. Cause I had, you know, I had a hereditary condition and was told a lot of things. And I literally healed my body through my thoughts and my beliefs about myself. So that's what I'm super passionate about. And I'd love to share more about that. That's I would love to hear what like, what like lights the fire inside of you when you're researching and wanting to explore science in the realm of like, okay, how can I now make sense of what I'm already experiencing and what we're calling spiritual, which was really just for me, all of life is spiritual because we're spirit and body. So <laughs> uh, what like lights you up? What can you share that might even expand my mind right now to like go into? Mm, I love that question. And I love, I love, love, love that you are ignited by the work of Bruce Lipton and epigenetics because it's, it's one of the things that first caught my attention when I was, when he was first starting to do, when he first coined the term epigenetics when I was a kid, because very similarly, I walked a path of, uh, I was told at a very young age that I was, that my doctor told me I was given a lemon for a body. I'm like that's It's just written in stone. You're gonna be sick your whole life. Here's a ton of medication. And, and yeah. recognizing that my thoughts affect my cellular makeup and how my, my thoughts, my emotions affect my cellular makeup and how my DNA and RNA express was an incredibly liberating experience. Then mm -hmm. for me, I went one step deeper and it ignited one step further. What was deeper for me was the recognition that, that it is now testable in a lab I love this so much in peer reviewed scientific journals. It's not just like some wacko study. It's, it's, it was, it was tested again and again and again that our emotion affect not only our DNA, they affect the very stuff of which our universe is made of matter and energy. Mm -hmm. So the, one of my favorite studies, uh, which was published in, published in the scientific journal Nature, uh, study that they made, they wanted to see if the vacuum is self-organizing. So they made a vacuum, they took a little chamber and they made a vacuum and they introduced photons into it. And not super surprising, the photons were totally random. And then some genius scientist who was doing the experiment got this beautiful download. He was like, wait, what if we put human DNA in there? So, so they isolated human DNA and they introduced human DNA in the into the vacuum. And lo and behold, the photons in the vacuum organized into the double helix, the phi ratio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you take that one step further, we all, we know, surely it's been tested again and again and again that the human heart is a, an acoustical resonator. It creates a field of vibration around the human body. And we know that human emotion affects that, the vibration of the field that we put out. Now in another beautiful experiment, they took they took fetal cord blood DNA, so the most pristine DNA that, that we can find, uh, and they isolated it, and they had individuals who were trained to create specific emotional states near the DNA, and they witnessed what happened to the DNA when specific emotional states were resonated around it. And lo and behold, the DNA, human DNA, separate from any body, separate from any energy source, when it's around emotions like constricting emotions, like uh, fear, hatred, jealousy, 
into like a little knot and then begins to break down. And you can imagine what happens when it's in the, in the presence of expansive DNA or expansive emotions. The DNA, it, it blossoms, it unwinds and begins to separate as if it's about to create new life, separate from any energy source, separate from any body. So, so we know that human emotion affects our DNA and we know that our DNA affects not only our cells, our cellular makeup, it affects the very stuff of which our universe is made. So that's where it comes back for me to that Gospel of Thomas, be enveloped by that which you desire. If, if you embody that which you wish to see in the world, if you embody expansive emotions such as uh, gratitude, appreciation, joy, love, you are affecting the building blocks of your body and the building blocks of the entire cosmos, creating a ripple effect, which we have, we have no idea how far that goes out. It could go out to infinity. I kind of, I kind of like that story myself. <laughs> because literally last night I was watching on Gaia uh, an interview with this man who wrote this book about uh, this couple who was taken up into a IFO, an identified foreign object, a space a starship, and their experience they went through hypnosis and like they both recounted the same experience and so this whole book has been done about them and pretty much the the tests that were being done on them by the extraterrestrials was all to test their emotions and i've seen this and i've read about this in countless studies about experiences that people have with extraterrestrials is a lot of times they're coming here because they're curious about human emotion they're like this this powerful energy that these these people have this emotion because they don't typically have that that level of emotional response that humans have and they're here trying to study it and learn about it as well so this is a huge piece that you just shared that you're right it is going out and creating a ripple effect across the entire universe and other species are recognizing that and coming to say hey what is this magnificent energy and how do we get some of it <laughs> exactly. You know, so few human beings are aware that we actually have high technology, high technology, which, which other beings from other planets are witnessing and going, oh my goodness, we need to go examine that technology. We have it inside of our bodies, inside of our DNA. There's a there's a whole new side of biology which is exploring the human heart, which for a long time we thought that emotion came from the limbic system of the brain. And it's true, the limbic system responds to and, and creates emotion in certain respects. That said, the human heart is what resonates the frequency of the emotion that we're experiencing. And that, that resonant frequency has the power to affect the world in nearly infinite ways. You can, you can rewrite your genetics. You can heal yourself as you did. You can heal your body just with your thoughts. You can, you can heal another human being just with your resonant energy. You can manifest, you can manifest what we would call in this reality magic. And it's only magic because we have yet to fully explain the scientific backing to it. And it really what it is, it's inner technology that we have, that we all have, whether we choose to tap into it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I read this definition about magic once. Well, I'm really into the etymology of words. And as you know, because we work together and I'm constantly like going in etymology words while we're talking. <laughs> and magic, this one key word that comes in is like our supernatural capacity. And to me, that anytime the word supernatural is used, it means this is natural. This is a natural meaning uh, everyone has it. It's a part of our nature to hold this. It's just like knowing that each gene has a shadow, a gift, a Siddhi frequency. That's like, okay, we have our shadow natural frequencies. We have our gift and then we have our supernatural frequencies. And magic is just one of them. It's that supernatural frequency that every single being has. 
and can tap into when they choose to, to unlock and move through their shadows. And this is something that I've been researching in science recently about the, the subconscious and really what they're starting to find about the junk DNA is really all of the history of the planet and of human beings <laughs> that, <laughs> that before science was just stuck to this linear timeline and now they're able to go and, and the junk DNA is all like interwoven and not linear at all because it's based off emotion and based off our experience and based off all these things that are totally irrational to a linear timeline. It's like the divine feminine that just runs around in this cosmic like tornado going every which way. And they're now able to like unravel these pieces of our junk DNA because even science is starting to think in a more universal perspective rather than it just being this linear thought process. And uh, that's where I get like super geeked out is when it comes into because I love learning more and more and more about the mind and about our subconscious because rewiring programs, I feel like we're really just on the precipice of what we can do with our subconscious mind. Like we haven't even fully cracked into what our subconscious mind really is and how we can really rewrite these programs and like we just basically understand the subconscious mind and I'm so excited to see how we can like go even more into the depths as more humans are now being willing, you know, to go there. Because at first Freud kind of scared people away from the subconscious and was like, you, if you go there, you're going to want to sleep with your mother. Like, <laughs> 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 oh, and these Freud. things that People, right bless his soul he brought us into an awareness of something he expanded us and now we're expanding even more <laughs> and so all of you beautiful beings zechariah loving his energy and all the other two that are here your names are popping up it says we feel you <sighs> I, I've been diving very deeply. I love that you brought up our understanding or our inner standing or our lack thereof of the subconscious. Uh, because just in the last couple of days, I've been diving into what we call the subconscious. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know from the etymology because you're the, you're the word priestess, uh, subconscious, that which is beneath consciousness, that which is unconscious. Uh, that said, we considered it to be like we have the conscious and that's the way it is. Where now we're coming into an understanding, like I mentioned, there is there are 40,000 sensory neurites in the heart, which think, process, remember, and store information independently from the brain. And an enormous amount of what we think of as subconscious is actually our little brain in our heart. Mm. There's, there's a whole beautiful side of uh, understanding the heart and its anatomy, which is diving deeply into the possibility, the theory at this moment, that, that our heart may not even be purposed for pumping blood. We have, we have spirals in our veins which allow the blood to flow similarly to the lymphatic system. If you move, your blood moves through your veins in a centrifugal way. So, mm -hmm. so the heart pumping, if the heart stops, the blood will continue to move as long as the body is moving. The body can live without a heart if there's something else creating even a slight amount of motion. So, so it comes so back to that understanding of what does the heart do? It creates a vibrational field around the body. Right. So then what would be... Okay, so let's just, this is something new for me. So what would be the experience then if, for instance, someone's heart goes through failure and wants to like, I believe in this new science, what would happen when the body is sleeping? How would the body keep moving or would they have to be like sleeping on a vibrational bed that like keeps your body, their blood flowing while they're sleeping? Exactly. Unless we turn into sharks. It's kind of like sharks, like sharks cannot be still they have to keep because otherwise they'll die exactly <laughs> you, you, 
you hit the nail on the head so that they've done studies in terms of human beings surviving without hearts and all that has to happen is a small amount of movement either being created by the the first studies were done by having their blood pumped through a machine and the, then the machine pumping back but the machine had a fraction of the power of the human heart the human heart has an enormous amount of power and the machine was like a little tiny pump this big and a pump this big kept the, the blood flowing. And then they started experimenting with, well, what if the heart stops and we have a vibrating table that we just creates a little bit of movement for the body. And lo and behold, we're finding that even the slightest amount of movement. So if, if you survived without a heart and you wanted to sleep, then you would just need a vibrating bed. One of those old motels wow. or something. <laughs> 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 Although the motel, I think the motel beds, you have to put quarters in, so that wouldn't be <laughs> You would definitely need one that's going to run for your full eight hours of subtle vibration. This is amazing. I absolutely love this. And I love this. This is so incredible because like re heart replacement surgery, that's something that can really be catastrophic for someone's experience in their body. Yeah. And you have a way of not having to do that. Like there's this whole other science that's pretty much saying, hey, we don't actually require this organ. Well, first and foremost, we have three hearts and the physical heart is just one of those three. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and our understanding of our inner standing of, like we've thought of the human body as, as a machine. For, for so long, we thought of it as like, it's like an automobile. You know, if the carburetor breaks, you take out the carburetor, you put a new one in. The human body is so much more complex than that. That we, we have just barely skimmed the surface in terms of our understanding of the human body. And, and modern science has yet to dive into, well, they've, they've dived a little bit into two of our three hearts. <laughs> the, the third one they have yet to really dive into. Another really beautiful reality that I've come upon recently is there's not, there's not sensory neurites in the gut. There are, however, more serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin receptors in the gut than there are in the brain. So there's a greater ability to process and react to hormones which create emotional and uh, physical responses in the gut than in the brain. So you this is huge for people who have an, a tendency when they're feeling their emotions go crazy and they're feeling depressed to like put food into their mouths. And that's starting to trigger those, those hormones in their, the chemicals in their body that help them to feel good. So this is just like a huge piece that people should really understand because a lot of people do have that tendency to cope emotionally with food to feel better like why does the food make you feel better well because your gut is releasing serotonin and dopamine and these feel-good hormones that of course you're going to start to feel better exactly when I, I teach people to do a belly massage daily and i massage my my solar plexus and my belly like down through my intestines every single day and it feels so good after doing that and that can be like just like rubbing your thymus gland like if you know these places where your body releases these chemicals from, you can use your hands and massage those parts of your body to release those chemicals. It's like getting a really great massage. Like you feel high afterwards because all these chemicals are being released. You don't need to, to, to go out to do that though. You can just simply like rub those parts of your body and release those chemicals. They have studies that show the, the few studies that they've done on the thymus gland, which is the sacred heart. It's one of the three hearts that we're talking about. For those of you who are like, what are these ladies talking about? Three hearts. <laughs> we have our physical heart that we used to think was for pumping our blood. Now Emily's blowing our mind and expanding us immensely beyond that perception. We have our heart chakra or energy center, the Anahata chakra, that is the energy body. And then we have our sacred heart or our higher heart, which is in our thymus glands that 
pretty much when we expand that, it, it connects us to our soul's purpose. And it also is the gland that pretty much governs our immune system in our body. And I just love that because it starts to correlate this, this knowing that our lives are so meaningful and purposeful that if you are disconnected from why you're here, from your body's immune system is going to start to fail so that you start to make your way out of this particular body so you can go back to source, get your recharge, and try it again. <laughs> and, and thus, all of our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions that told us that that which we seek is within us, that becomes actually a tangible fact. Like, wait, the, the healing that I seek, the happiness that I seek, the spiritual activation that I seek is all inside. Mm -hmm. And it's not just some some ethereal concept at, or something that you read in a sacred text and like, well, I guess I'll accept that as dogma. Like you can, you can experience it in a fundamentally tangible way. Hmm. I've, Isn't I've that what's so fun about being here now is that we can really experience all of these things in a way that's so tangible and we can taste it. Like we just know everything that we've known within and like and and really slowing down a lot of soul evolution because we haven't been able to fully express the soul truth because the society that had been created was so oppressive to those truths coming out and was blocking the very wisdom from being able to like uncover these truths and now we're in a time where we can really uncover these things and grow exponentially and expand beyond our imagination. And if people start to say you're crazy, like people will tell me I'm crazy and I'll like pop up, I'll like send a, a link over, be like, hey, look, is this scientist who's been doing this study for the last 50 years of his life, is he crazy? And all these other people that have validated this study? Yeah, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a scientific paradigm which is currently being shattered and the same as the social paradigm and the spiritual paradigm, uh, there are some growing pains. Yeah. Shattering paradigm can feel a little bit like death uh, <laughs> because something is dying. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and individuals who, who have taken these parts of, of these paradigms and implanted them into their own identity and said, this is part of me, can feel very much like like something within them is dying when they experience something like the cognitive uh, kickback of, of an, an idea that is not aligned with that paradigm. That said, there is, there is a huge amount of research as, as Bruce Lipton liked to say, what does he say? Rock solid research, rock solid science. Yeah. <laughs> rock solid, rock solid science, hard and evidence, and hardcore, uh, hard, hardcore science, <laughs> which sort of it harkens to density. Then again, science is it's a very dense, dense thing. It's a very like it's it's based in material ability to measure and and have reliable results from a repeated experiment. Because in science, there are, no, there are no facts, there are theories, and then there's research that backs up that theory. <laughs> and, and at this point, there's, there's countless scientists who are, who are backing up these theories, which they've been being passed down to us since, since Egypt and long before. <laughs> Hmm. I've I've passed that rubbing or tapping the thalamus, the thymus, not the thalamus. The thalamus is up here. Although the thalamus is really important too. Yeah. The thymus, the thymus, to to countless people who have had these and not heard from them for months until until they call me up out of the blue and say, "That was you changed. How how did you do that?" Well, I didn't do anything. 
you yeah. tapped into your own endocrine system. And the endocrine yeah. system is something which is, which is tragically unexplored in our current paradigm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, at least in the Western world, the Eastern world has a bit more uh, evidence and thought and insight into the endocrine system because they recognize how significant and important it is to really understand these glands and the higher functioning of them. Yes. I mean, the endocrine system, if you really tap into it, which is crazy because a lot of the Western world is designed to close down the endocrine system. The very things that are put in our water are designed to close down the endocrine system. And that's like really getting into that conversation of what we first talked about of why science wasn't allowed to go near spirituality. And it's like, there is a, yeah, don't know, don't let these people know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly you have to you have to buy your salvation you have to buy your health you have to hand your power to someone else because heaven forbid you find out that you have high technology dwelling within your body <laughs> that can not only heal and allow you to thrive it can allow everything and everyone around you to step into the path of the highest. Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid that we figure that out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but blessed be, we are figuring that out. For, this is the great remembering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's the key is really allowing, allowing this information to be shared. To, to not just keep it to ourselves, to have conversations. And even if you you know nothing about it, just, hey, I read this, what do you think about this? Just so people start talking about what's possible. What's possible? Because once we put more of our energy in towards that, then more people will start to, like the people who are, you know, qualified and doing this, I'm not doing any scientific research studies on the the genes of the body. I do them on the, the mind because that's where I'm like, yes, let's like research. And I do them on the physical body, I guess, as far as like food's concerned. I do a lot of this whole body I consider to be a scientific experiment. And that's like the way that I live life is that the body is a scientific experiment and the spirit is what's driving the science experiment. And so for me, science and spirituality have always been like, they're, they're, they're skipping down the street together. <laughs> exactly. Because it's everything that we are and just sharing that with other people so people get excited. This is the whole idea that once more of us collectively have our attention on something, that something expands and ignites because we impact our environment exponentially and are able to create huge movements so long as we just put our attention on it. And that's some of the science that you were recently talking about, you know, a few minutes ago or whatever. Who knows about time now? It's another <laughs> topic for another day uh, that said about how we impact our environment. Yeah. And it's, it's beyond, you know, words create your world. And I love the, um, I was just reading uh, some of the, the things about, like that Bruce Lipton talks about and how, you know, the hardcore science and this is just, this is chemistry now. This is like basic understandings that we create our reality and we impact our world is chemistry. Like it's, it can be proven in a, in a lab. And like even Dr. Emoto was proving a lot of that with the studies he was doing with water because everything is water and, and we, if we create the molecules of the water and they shape shift based off of our emotions or thoughts or beliefs. And if everything around us is water, then everything is being shape-shifted by our emotions, thoughts, and beliefs. Exactly, exactly. That, that study that I mentioned where they took uh, pristine DNA and experimented on whether it was, and found it was highly affected by human emotion. The intention mm -hmm. of the study, it was actually a side effect that, that they ended up doing a study on DNA. They started with a study on water how human emotion affects water. 
And then they were like, well, we're here. We have all this equipment. Let's do some DNA tests, see what happens. And of course, then a whole field of research exploded from that moment, like a, like a big gap in stench, all like, well, let's test water. And maybe as a side effect, we'll test DNA too. Wait a second. <laughs> Wait a second. Some of the, the cutting edge physics that I've been diving really deeply into lately is, is coming back to a field of study which was totally thrown out in the 1940s and 50s, I believe, uh, where, where the term the ether field came up. And, and they did this really hodgepodge study. They did this very, they were like, we're gonna prove definitively whether the ether field exists because it seems like it exists. And we're gonna test and see if it does. And it was just this one study, I think it was in like 1947 possibly. And it was essentially, it was essentially equivalent to, to licking your finger and putting your hand up in the air and saying, well, I don't feel any air. Hardcore science. <laughs> and that one study created this huge ripple effect through the scientific paradigm, which said, okay, there is no ether field. And now mainstream science is coming back and saying, well, actually there is a field that connects all things. And it's, it comes back to quantum mechanics and how uh, quantum mechanics essentially for any of the equations in quantum mechanics to work, they have to what they call renormalize the density of the vacuum, the vacuum being the space in between what we call matter. So there's vacuum in between every one of our atoms, there's vacuum all around us all the time and inside of us. I love, I love just as a caveat, I love the, the fact that if we took every human being on the entire planet and took out all the empty space or what we call the vacuum out of our bodies and left what we call matter, it would be condensed to the size of a sugar cube. <laughs> we are mostly vacuum. And so for, for quantum mechanics to work, for any of the equations to, to come out with reliable results, they have to renormalize the density of the vacuum, which essentially means they found an infinite value for the density of the vacuum. And they're like, we can't, we can't do math with that. There's actually a term in, in physics and mathematics for that. They call it a nasty infinity. The nasty infinity. We can't do anything with that. What do we do with that? So they took, they took a number, which was essentially one, one Planck square. So the Planck's distance is the smallest measurement that we have at this moment in this paradigm. And they took one Planck square and they divided the density of the vacuum by that. So what this tells us essentially is, is that the vacuum, what, what we call empty space is actually infinitely dense and could be thought of as essentially a liquid or actually because it's so dense, it could be thought of as a liquid crystal, an infinitely dense liquid crystal, which by, by way of the, the experiment, which I mentioned earlier, which was done by the Lebdev Institute, I believe, the experiment where they, they found that the vacuum was affected by human DNA, we, we can then, extrapolate that this infinitely dense liquid crystal, which is everything, is affected by our DNA, which is affected by our emotion. So that basically it's, every time I tell this to someone who like, isn't like, oh God, you're geeking out. I'm gonna go hide my face now. <laughs> every time I tell this to someone who's actually like, okay, I'm paying attention. Their, their first response almost invariably is, that is so empowering because, because what it means is that, is that we are not, we have infinite ability to affect an infinitely yeah. dense liquid crystal that is our reality. Mm -hmm. I take two things from that. And these two things are, you know, foundations of what we call, you know, this spiritual liberation is knowing that we are the universe. And that's, that pretty much tells us that we are infinitely dense. So you are infinity, you are the universe. And also another piece that 
that I really resonate with is that we're all diamonds, that we're all just like this crystallized light formation and, and we are just diamonds reflecting our world. And, you know, if you look at, look at a diamond and, and it hold it upside down, you spin it around, you get all these different realities. Well, if you bring us all down, we're just liquid diamonds. Like we're just this liquid crystal and here you are, you're this, that's what you are, the crystalline core of everything. So I will often tell people, you know, they've got to go down and connect to the crystal core of the earth. They got to extend out and connect to the crystal core of the sun or connect to the crystal center of their cell. And that's where the healing is. <laughs> it's like, that's, these are all what people would say are like, uh new age beliefs or whatever you know and some people will look at me like i'm batshit crazy and that's okay and other <laughs> people will be like yes i'm gonna talk to the crystal <laughs> that said now this this tells me that this is this is science this is something that they're they're having research to back now all of these things that we've been saying and that's what this whole conversation is about is the blending of the two and it, it's happening and so that's that's what i hear when i hear you totally geeking out and I'm like sitting here like yes <laughs> <laughs> this is everything that I've been knowing and saying and telling people and now it's just giving it to me in science I love that <laughs> well <laughs> yes yes exactly exactly that's we are, we are all liquid crystals. Uh, the two things that pop up in me when you, when you say we are, we are diamonds, we are liquid diamonds. Oh, I love that so much. We are yeah, right? <laughs> <sighs> so the two things that pop up are, are one, the study of fascia. Uh, so the fascia is connective tissue which which surrounds every cell every blood vessel every bone we know this mm -hmm. because we know anatomy uh, mm -hmm. and studies into fascia have found that the the microscopic strands of connective tissue which which surround every bit of our entire body inside and out uh, they are hollow and they are filled with what, for, for the best of our knowledge, what we can say is what, if it were in our spine or in our brain, we would call it cerebral spinal fluid. They're filled with that same fluid. And it's incredibly dense. So, so I've heard it said many times before that each of our cells, each of our blood vessels, each of our bones is surrounded by essentially liquid crystal cerebral spinal fluid in the form of liquid crystal. So we are liquid diamonds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very tangibly, factually. And yes. we, are, we are made to, to resonate frequency. You know that each, each cell of our body is surrounded by this liquid crystal, which is resonating the frequency, which is created by our heart, which is reacting to our emotional state, which we can consciously control through, through conscious thought and effort and also through our breath. Pranayama is really helpful. <laughs> if, I, if I give yeah. any, anyone that I work with, if I give them one breath technique, it's always the ujjayi breath. It's like, mm -hmm. you're gonna start anywhere, start with ujjayi because ujjayi, yeah. <laughs> ujjayi is like it, puts the control of your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems back into your hands. It was yep. uh, a quote attributed to the Buddha, supposedly. I always, I always take quotes attributed to the Buddha with a small grain of salt because it's kind of like, kind of like saying it's, it's, a quote, no. it's a quote from <laughs> Nefertiti. <laughs> yeah, she said that. Um, this is a I said yeah. Uh, a quote from the Buddha said that our breath is the bridge between the seen and the unseen and between the conscious and the unconscious. Because if you tell, you tell your eyes to blink, they blink. If you tell your stomach to stop digesting, nothing happens. If you tell your breath to stop, it stops. Forget about telling it to stop. It just goes on its own. It's it's the the first 
the first wave of our ability to control our physical body in a conscious way. And then the next thing that came up with the whole liquid crystal, we are liquid diamonds thing is, is the magnificent happenstantial thing that when they, when they were starting to renormalize uh, the vacuum for quantum mechanics to work, they, they took that little plonk square and they measured how many, how many plonks are actually contained within a plonk square. Uh, and within, within a Planck square, same number as the approximate volume of our universe. So, so when you say we are the universe, it's actually, actually it can come out in, in equations that like, wait, no, we, we are. Every, every atom is the entire universe condensed. And, and now I'm really geeking out. <laughs> so something that this is like just sort of to curi bring curiosity into my mind is this concept that I'll often do where if I have something in my body that is maybe diseased on the physical level or the emotional level or any level of my being that's not feeling in alignment with health and with vitality, I will imagine it to be this piece of charcoal because ultimately charcoal is like transform into diamonds and I'll like penetrate it with this light that I, you know, connect to the sun and I'll bring that light down and I'll like penetrate that charcoal and have this visualization process of the layers of the charcoal kind of shedding to unveil the diamond frequency of whatever organ it is that's not feeling right or Maybe it's anger that I'm experiencing or whatever it is to like unveil the diamond frequency. So I'm kind of like, okay, well, where, how does that tie into science? And because if we are liquid crystal, we're liquid diamond, that process has to be somewhere inside of our body as well. Because if we are, you know, the micro, the macro, well, that's what happens in nature as well. How do we get to the, the Siddhi or the diamond frequency of ourselves? There's got to be some type of, of, charcoal that we kind of like bring light through i don't know <laughs> I, I love it and i hesitate i hesitate because like this is this is going really far into what what makes people hide their face because they're like oh god what she's she's gone off the deep end um, so so deep. <laughs> okay let's go off the deep end uh, I am I'm a research delegate in uh, the Resonance Science Foundation, which is essentially, it was a team, it was a team of physicists who all came together to research and verify and support this one research paper that was published uh, actually on December 21st, 2012. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that research paper was titled The Schwarzschild Proton. It's a, it's a mm. difficult name to pronounce. That said, uh, it theorized that the protons within our atoms are actually black holes, uh, which is the, the as above, so below thing. And it was, it was a difficult, and it still is a difficult pill for the scientific community to swallow. That said, that paper theorized and predicted several things which later have come to fruition. Like for instance, the paper predicted that there are black holes at the center of every galaxy. Initially, the paper, like it was, it was patented, it was sent to the Library of Congress and a bunch of people peer reviewed it and said, yeah, it's great. And then it was published and a bunch of people said, no, there can't be a black hole at the center of every galaxy. And now, lo and behold, years later, uh, we have concluded that there are black holes at the center of every galaxy. <laughs> and there are also black holes than in the center of our being. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> there's a lot, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so as above, so below, each proton inside each atom 
is actually a mini black hole, which this actually, it, uh, it, it perfect, perfectly and exactly predicts the, the strong and the weak force of, of modern physics of the, the standard model, which we, we just made up those forces because we were like, well, something's holding it all together. We're not yeah. sure. Uh, so if you, if you act, if you take two little protons and, and calculate them as if they are black holes, as, as if they are microscopic mini black holes, that their repulsion and attraction to one another exactly equals the strong and the weak force. <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm not saying that it's like we've come to the holy grail of physics, the unification of, of quantum mechanics and cosmology. Um, I'm, I'm kind of saying that actually. So that's, that's, your, that's where your um, charcoal, the, the, the absolute density, the singularity turning into a diamond in our physical bodies, that's where that goes for me because, because in my okay. frame of reference, each of our protons, each of the protons within each of the atoms of our body is actually a black hole. Right, and all life, like black holes essentially birth the cosmos. Yes. Black, yes, okay. So essentially the charcoal is the black hole and we're going into that black hole to bring birth to the diamond. Yes. To the diamond frequency of whatever it's like giving birth to. Amazing. Just wrapping my mind around it in, in, in <laughs> the language that I can understand, which is spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm totally mind blown right now because this is this is huge to understand that this is happening inside. You know, we always have this awareness that like, you know, we're the micro of the macro and even in our planet. And now I'm just like, okay, where are all the black holes? Exactly. Volcanoes and things like that. And if you look at like Big Island, for instance, it's all this massive black land and this giant black hole that like gives us birth to this life. Okay. <laughs> totally geeking out right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, I love that. Just a few days ago, I was thinking, I was like, wait a second. So if, if it's as above, so below, then, then is the earth a torus and there's, there's a black hole at the center of the earth as well? Like, hold on a second now. There's, because, because, you know, if you look at it, if you look at it, you can take it from every step. You can, you can look at the protons and then in a cellular way, each cell, each cell has a toroidal field of energy around it. And it has uh, not a singularity, it has a, a blank space in the center of it that they're not sure why it's there. They're like, why is this a torus? We're not sure why. So, so then the cells are black holes. And then, and then our heart, which is the stillness, essentially a black hole is stillness. We come mm -hmm. spiraling out of stardust and spinning towards stillness. A black hole is is extremely dense stillness and our heart is the dense stillness which creates the toroidal field around us mm -hmm. and then our planet has toroidal fields and stillness within and then our solar system has toroidal fields and stillness within and then our galaxy like i i get so worked up about this i get so worked up <laughs> So then a, our heart is essentially a black hole. Is that what you're saying? And then, ev well, everything has a sun, like the earth has a heart, the sun has a heart, all of the planets have hearts and they all have these toroidal fields as well. And so essentially that's what's, in my understanding incorrectly, is just to put that into like, Jessica terms. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I understand the toroidal field and for anyone who may not that's like the I don't even know how to like kind of like visualize it it's the center and then it has the fields you've likely it's seen an image of it before like a fountain just google the toroidal field of the earth and you'll see a picture and you'll be like oh I remember that from if you took physics class or whatever 
you studied in science in school. Um, cool. Yeah. I think I think it's really cool. I'm glad you think it's cool too. <laughs> this is what I think about in my spare time. Wait a second. Because it, to me, it, it all comes down to fractals. It all comes down to fractals, like very literally from from science to spirit to our physical bodies to to our mental bodies to our emotional. It's all it's all self symmetry. Like dimensions. Dimensions are not like some sort of like you open a door and then you go through. It's it's about it's about size. It's about you know the dimension of the inner world is the micro. The dimension of the cosmos is the macro, and and it's a fractal self symmetry pattern that reflects from start to finish. And and now. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just sort of like trying to put words to these thoughts that are inside my head and just pleading to get out. Oh, oh. <laughs> As above, so below. It's all, it's all self-symmetry. It's all fractal mathematics. <sighs> mm -hmm. When I was, go ahead. I was just gonna say a little piece on fear. Will you, I'll hold it and I'll let you speak. The rest of your thought, yes. Something about uh, expounding upon that, what I said about how black holes are stillness. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea is with this unified field theory, uh, which I spend a lot of time studying <laughs> and geeking out on, uh, is, that, is that the infinitely dense vacuum, which permeates all things, uh, Spin is created within this infinitely dense vacuum by mild fluctuations in the energy of the vacuum. And those mild fluctuations, when compiled on top of one, one another, they exponentially grow. So it's not actually, it's not actually like the, the density or some crazy gravitational force or something like that that creates a black hole. It is a, it's like an eddy in water. Like you see flowing water and an eddy gets created. That's because there's a, a force of spin and then a still point in the middle. So, so the theory postulate that the spin of the cosmos and black holes, what we call black holes, was there, were there before matter came in to fill it in. And, and then we see stars spinning into a still point and we say, oh, look, there's a black hole. That density of the vacuum existed before matter came in to illuminate it. And that's where to me, it becomes a really great analogy for the human heart. Because, and it goes back to our, our ancient spiritual traditions, this idea that if we, if we tap into the stillness within, we connect to the infinite power of the cosmos. <laughs> I just had this vision of like there was the original black hole and when you go through a black hole like these black holes just create more universes and as you go through there's just more black holes that just birth more life and 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 then when we like zoom it all out, like zoom it out to the farthest perspective, we get this one black hole that's God and that just keeps birthing all these other experiences through it. And eventually when we return to source, we go back up to the giant black hole. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I just thought was happening mm -hmm. in my mind as you were explaining that. And, and that is not contained within, I have to put in this disclaimer, this is not contained within the theory of the, the Resonance Science Foundation that said, that's, that's where my mind and my heart go. Wait. Yeah. If, if the center of everything is a black hole, which is stillness, then God is the ultimate stillness. And that's where this, this download that came through years and years ago and it made no sense to me at the time and it just kept repeating in my head something about uh we come spinning out of stardust and spiraling towards stillness <sighs> yes exactly <laughs> you know jessica you know 
<laughs> and that's so beautiful when we think about the teachings and the tangible teachings for how do we get, how do we, you know, embody God consciousness? How do we go to these places? How do we, you know, connect more to our spirit? So we get still. We, we sit in meditation and we, we become still. It's, and it's, from that, everything is born. Exactly. And that's, it's repeated through pretty much every ancient spiritual dictum or, or doctrine or practice or, or tradition throughout, throughout human history as far as we know it, uh, is, is find the still point at the center and that's where you'll find God. Yeah. And of course it aligns perfectly if, if our individual protons are actually mini black holes. So find the stillness at the center and the center, every point in the vacuum, every point in your being, every point in the cosmos is the center when every point is a black hole. I am totally geeking out on black holes right now. I'm fairly sure I'm going to like try to find as many documentaries as I possibly can on Gaia tonight that I have to do with black holes. That said, another thought just kind of came through is this one process that my mentor taught me about when I'm processing things in my body is like drop my consciousness, not into the center of the heart, to the back of the heart where this like void exists, the stillness exists, this this, the front of the heart is usually really wrapped up in whatever we're continuously receiving, receiving and receiving. And the, the back, the void, the, the actual entrance of our heart is in the back side of our body. And that's that like void. And so when you sit in that space, that place of stillness, whatever you're bringing up, whether it's anger or hatred or whatever these emotions that you're trying to heal and prosper through and transmute, and alchemize, like the alchemy comes when you keep your consciousness in that center, in that what I now know is a black hole, and bringing it through that, and then the black hole essentially like transmutes that into light, into new light, and then this new star dust explodes out of it. Exactly. That's alchemy. Yes. Yes. Exactly. <sighs> And alchemy is, as far as it's been defined in all of our history, is it's this marriage of science and spirituality. It's, yeah. it's where scientists, like some of our most famous scientists were actually secret alchemists. Um, mm -hmm. Isaac Newton practiced alchemy in his, in his dark corners of his room while, while he was being heralded as the king of modern physics. Newtonian physics, he was an alchemist because he understood that science can only take you so far. And then you have to dive into the unseen, the unknowable. Yeah, and, and that's the thing about, uh, just to just roll off that for a moment, is a lot of these scientists were getting pressured to keep that stuff to themselves. I've, I've watched a lot of documentaries of, of various scientists and a lot of, a lot of them have been killed essentially killed uh in tragic die in tragic ways because they start to go a little bit further and i watched this one documentary and i can't remember what it's called now on gaia and they were these doctors in this panel and he was like researching something and wanted to go further into the unknown he's like well wow we can go so much further and the school that he was then working for was like we're no longer going to fund your your study we're cutting off all of it like you can't go any further like there is a rule in the scientific research, like guidelines or whatever they call it, that you cannot go to that place. Yep, exactly. It's some of our, our greatest and most influential scientists were either like straight up martyred, massacred, yeah. <laughs> or where they wanted to go, or their funding was taken from them, their reputations were ruined and they, they lived the rest of their life in misery and squalor because of trying to tap into things which did not fit with the current scientific paradigm. You know, we, we are talking right now, we have this fabulous connection in the, in the internet and wireless 
and all of this beautiful ability to to talk across across hundreds or even thousands thousands of miles you're in new york right yeah yep. thousands of miles <laughs> uh because of nikola tesla and nikola tesla ended his life in because because he tried to take his understanding of what was essentially emerging of science and spirituality. He studied all of the ancient texts. He studied the ancient Egyptian knowledge. He studied ancient biblical knowledge. He studied Chinese knowledge. And, and he turned that into practical technology, which the world could use. And those who were funding him and those who were supporting him said, yeah, no, we're going to ruin you now. Because because free energy for the world is not something you're allowed to talk about. <laughs> yeah, no. Mm -mm, because that takes money out of those people who think money is power. So there are a couple yeah. of things I want to say and then we can like wrap up our, our time here is that first and foremost, I watched this little boy who is 10 years old who uh, is, is graduating from college right now, 10 years old. I shared about him in the Rainbow Path. Mm -hmm. And I swear he is the same, the spirit of Nikola Tesla reincarnated now in this boy's life. And he is about to like blow shit up in the science community. <laughs> and the important thing for this conversation and for what we mentioned in the beginning is that why this is all possible now is because there are people like you and I and anyone watching this video that are, that are saying this is important. And we are going to protect this, this, these studies and this information because we believe it's important and we are no longer gonna be controlled by someone that says, no, you can't go that far. These breakthroughs in science are because someone said when they were pushed up against the wall and said, you can't go any far, any farther, they said, I'm gonna do it anyways. I'm gonna go there anyways. And, and that's what we want to support, you know, breaking people out of their box and their limited perspective. And we've got to support the science community right now because they're trying to break through barriers that have been told no, no, no by governments and religions and all of these things. And there are beings that are incarnating just like you and I that are, that are inspired and bold and courageous and ready to change our current situation and they're breaking through things in the science world and, and you're a part of that now and and that's something that all of us that are involved in spirituality and, and expanding and personal development we really should be continuously putting our energy into those beings that are really pushing and breaking barriers right now in the science community to bring truth to those beings that that require a little bit more than faith to get to that evolutionary tipping point. 100% agreed. There's, yeah. there's nothing, there's no pathology in the fact that we are, we have been in the Kali Yuga. There's, there's nothing mm. wrong with the great cycles of time. We have been in a materialistic age. That is, that is a known fact. Whether you, you look at it as the yuga cycles or you just look at our modern world, our modern world. <laughs> <you know. laughs> yeah, exactly. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And that's been the paradigm that we've been in. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. The beauty that we get to experience in this particular lifetime is that we are on the cusp of a new age, wherein beings are more and more ready to, to break that paradigm of if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And there's so many beings who are, who are on the cutting edge of this shift. And, and there's so much support that can be given energetically, even just, just dwelling in it in your heart. You know, that coming back to that quote at the beginning of be embodied by that which you desire, you know, become that which you desire and you will see it in the world. And I feel like that's a beautiful way to 
to segue out of this conversation and to shift gears as we're going into our hour and 20 minutes, maybe? Time. Who knows? Just we'll leave you all with that amazing quote. And so uh, I, whether you're just tuning in now or watching this later, I hope that you found value in this. Please, please follow Emily if you want to have more of this information. She shares it on her page. So follow her, follow Love's Mission, like get involved and, and start to put more energy into this. Uh, and if you have questions, you can, Emily, how can people reach you? Uh, through Facebook, <clears throat> through Facebook, Emily Dean Benson, uh, Emily Dean Benson 1111. Also, my website is breathebeloved.org. And my email is jb at breathebeloved.org. If you have questions, I love answering questions. <laughs> yeah, and speak out about it. So if you're not going to run and hide from her geeking out, like, connect. Because <laughs> these conversations expand us all. So thank you so much. I am super, super inspired by the information that you shared today and how we could kind of, like, I feel like we are a really great blend to like bring this together because I, I am not super. Uh, I'm totally into science. That said, I, I like to take science and then see how it weaves into spirit. And you have all of the studies, and so this was like this beautiful blend of how we could really mesh this. So I had so much fun today, and I can't thank you enough for joining me. <laughs> Likewise. Tenfold, uh, 100%. So, so deeply grateful for everything that you do and everything that you are and for this opportunity to connect <sighs> an alchemical crucible of ingredients coming together which form something greater than the original product. We're diamonds, We're y'all. Diamonds. <laughs> we are liquid diamonds. <laughs> That's what Great I'm taking from this conversation. <laughs> Amazing. Well, much love to you, goddess. I will see you soon. And bye, everyone. Thanks for joining.